Welcome. Uh, good evening to all of you. My name is Eric Neumeyer. I'm the school's pro director, faculty development, and I'll be chairing uh, tonight's event. Um, let me first of all say a few sort of ground rules before I'm going to very briefly introduce our speaker because he doesn't need much in terms of introduction. Uh, we are hoping to make the event available via a podcast. Uh, Jeffrey will speak for about 50 minutes, which means we should have about half an hour for uh, questions and answers. I know uh, many of you are keen to ask questions, which is good. Uh, and we are interested in questions, not second short lectures. Please, <laughs> if you can keep them very short. And the question is usually something that can actually be answered uh, as well. Okay, uh, without uh, much more ado, our speaker tonight, uh, Jeffrey Sachs, as I said, needs very little uh, introduction. Fortunately so, since I could actually fill an entire lecture just talking about him from his becoming professor at Harvard at the age of 28. I think I finished my PhD then, uh, to it, when I was 28. <laughs> Uh, to his many prizes, the many citations as one of the world's most influential and best-known economists, to the many significant intervention, he, interventions he has made across a, a huge range of issues at the very heart of humanity's fate and progress, be it through his top-notch academic research, his more popular best-selling books, or his many advisory roles to a huge number of governments and international organizations, of course, most notably of which is the United Nations. When the man sleeps, frankly, I do not know, if at all, uh, such is the range of his activity. But he did not come to listen to me, so let me do a very, very briefly, simply to say, Professor Sachs is currently a university professor at Columbia University, but he's also a visiting LSE Centennial professor here. That's why he's actually giving his second speech uh, in a row, though yesterday was on a different uh, topic. Tonight's topic, he will discuss climate justice. Uh, one of the many reasons why climate change seems such an intractable problem to solve is that it throws up tremendous issues of distribution and justice, much more so than any environmental problem before. Hence, like all of you, I'm very keen to hear Jeff's proposal for a practical framework for implementing global climate change. Please uh, join me in welcoming Jeffrey. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eric, and uh, thanks uh, to LSE again for the chance to uh, get together with you to muse out loud. I do not have a full, uh, worked out, uh, solid, rock solid proposal to uh, give you. I have some thoughts and directions. They're certainly not mine alone, but they are trying to be practical in what is after all, just about the most practical problem that we have, and one that I'm delighted to say this university and, uh, of course, uh, uh, Lord Nick Stern has played an absolutely pivotal role, a unique role in the world. But we're in a very difficult race against time, and there is tremendous unfairness about all that is happening and tremendous danger about all that's happening with climate change. It's uh, perhaps uh, uh, epitomizes this issue that uh, Donald Trump, I have to always uh, swallow so I don't digress, <laughs> uh, uh, is in Puerto Rico today uh, after the disaster of Hurricane Maria. He's a very confused man. They're uh, very disoriented, uh, so I'm sure it's quite a day there. Um, but it is uh, part and parcel of this challenge that we are not only talking about the complexities of energy transformation and decarbonization and 
how to make the world uh, as safe as possible in the future, but dealing with a very rapidly rising number of disasters year in, year out now. Hottest years, heat waves, droughts, floods, uh, extreme tropical cyclones, uh, many uh, ecological changes uh, that are beyond our understanding. Uh, so we're also operating in a new environment where we don't have a statistical record or history to be sure of just about anything, but we can be pretty sure that it's dangerous and getting more dangerous and that the time is very short to act on these issues. And that's really what I want to talk about uh, tonight. So Hurricane Maria was the fourth in four extraordinarily powerful hurricanes that barreled through uh, the Caribbean, uh, and uh, two of which made very serious uh, damage and landfall in the United States as well, but all four devastated parts of uh, the Caribbean. And they were, uh, in some cases, of record scale. Um, and we don't know enough uh, in terms of the uh, record of these hurricanes to be able to have uh, what I'll talk about uh, in a little while, a, a serious, uh, precise attribution of anthropogenic forcings in these hurricanes. We just don't know uh, with statistical precision how much of the hurricane intensity and damage or frequency was really the result of global warming, but we have a lot of reasons to believe from theory and climatology that indeed the warming that's underway has both intensified the storms by adding energy to uh, the sea, basically through uh, unusually warm waters in the Atlantic and the Gulf of Mexico, and most likely, but uh, from a theoretical perspective, added uh, precipitation, because these were rain bombs, as they're being called, uh, because of the warmer atmosphere and therefore the higher water vapor uh, being held in the warmer atmosphere. And almost certainly much more serious storm surges and flooding from one incontrovertible fact, and that is that global warming has raised the ocean level in that part of the world by about a third of a meter during the past century, and that's a lot in terms of the resulting storm surges and the flooding that results from any given storm. So this was a, a series of disasters uh, that uh, hit uh, this summer. And a major question is what to do. These are, uh, in most cases, poor countries. Uh, in the case of Puerto Rico, a colony of the United States, we don't call it that, but it is uh, one of uh, the remaining colonies of the United States, and it was already bankrupt, literally uh, financially bankrupt in receivership this summer, not being very well taken care of, mind you but uh, in a very, very deep economic crisis before the hurricane hit. Now it's devastated. Uh, Americans don't care. Now we have a mass murder to uh, worry about uh, also uh, as of yesterday. So in the U.S. these days, every day is crazy. Uh, and it starts with the craziness at the top. I'll interject that only every few minutes. Uh, but uh, it does reflect my profound preoccupation with being led by a madman. Uh, but in any event, um, who's going to rebuild? Who's going to pay for this? How could this conceivably be fair? What does economic justice have to say about uh, this issue? Because one thing is absolutely for sure, the Caribbean caused almost nothing of the devastation that hit, uh, and yet it is being visited by these uh, occurrences. And in general, one can say 
couple of things about climate change that I think are uh, fairly obvious. First, the poor are always uh, extraordinarily vulnerable to shocks because they have no buffer. And so they're living in dangerous areas. They are uh, bereft of stable structures. Uh, they don't have bank accounts uh, to give them reserves. They don't have claims on uh, public services. They don't have a voice in public policy. So when disasters hit, they're alone uh, and uh, without uh, ability to buffer. And I think it's probably also true, though I haven't done the systematic work, but I would claim that poor people live in more dangerous places in general. And that's because the places that they're pushed to. Uh, and one of the uh, kinds of dangers that I see all the time is the dryland region of the world, which is a large part of the Earth's surface. And the drylands mean that rainfall is low and the vulnerability to seasonal or uh, interannual variation in rainfall is profound. And it happens climatologically to also be the case that the old uh, saying that uh, the wet places will get wetter and the dry places drier has a lot of merit because the patterns of precipitation reflect the deep convective cycles that are uh, perturbed and intensified by global warming. So the Hadley cycle, which causes the uh, equatorial rainfall and the uh, dry desert and semi-desert regions intensifies with warming, and so the drylands spread. And the drylands are tough places to live. On the margins of deserts, people are very poor. They're nomadic uh, in Africa and in Central Asia. Uh, a fall of rainfall can be utterly catastrophic. So it's probably systematically true overall that not only are rich people better buffered, but poor people are more in the line of fire of these disasters as well, not accidentally, but by virtue of the fact that they're poor in part because they live in very difficult places. And they live in very difficult places because they've been pushed or excluded often from the more productive places uh, in the world. So it's multi-causal. We only have rough estimates of uh, the damage of this hurricane. Uh, First uh, estimates from the insurance industry were that this one storm uh, over a few days was 30 to $60 billion of damage, which is not a little bit for a single storm, especially when it's the fourth of four in a row uh, that hit over the last two weeks. The estimate for Hurricane Harvey, which made landfall in Houston, you recall, is about $200 billion of damage with a lot more value uh, at risk in the U.S. scene than in the Caribbean. So that's part of the difference of economic cost. But this is an enormous number for a poor region in the Caribbean. The estimate is that the covered insurance for this under private insurance is perhaps half. That seems high to me, uh, but maybe 30 to 50 percent if you add in all of the ancillary costs that will come in recovery insurance will certainly not cover more than half of, uh, and, and perhaps much less. And of course, systematically for poor people, less protection and coverage. So when we think about what's fair in this context, we have to think about what the problem is that we're dealing with. And the point I want to emphasize is that we're dealing with three interconnected problems. We usually talk about two and don't spend enough time talking about the one that I want to spend more time on this evening, uh, which is the losses and damages. We have the primary challenge of mitigation. This is for sure the most important part of the climate change agenda. Get us to safety as a planet. And that's an extraordinarily difficult challenge because what we have to do is almost madness when you state it and um, seemingly uh, 
unrealistic, though it is realistic if we decide we're going to do it, and that is we have to transform the energy system of the world in a period of 30 years to reach near zero carbon. That seems crazy to do. It is not an assignment you would happily take on. If someone just gave you that assignment, you would indeed uh, dismiss it as a kind of madness. Because the energy system is deeply set in our economy. It's deeply built in infrastructure, uh, whether it's the physical buildings, roads, transport networks. It's core to the industrial processes. The lifetime of this infrastructure varies from 20 years for the vehicles to hundreds of years for some of the buildings. There's profound retrofitting that needs to be done. The power plants have a lifetime of half a century. And yet, what do we know among the main facts of climate change and among the core targets that we've set for ourselves? And that is to stay well below 2 degrees Celsius warming in a circumstance where we have already warmed by about 1.1 degree, all measured relative to the so-called pre-industrial temperature. My colleagues measure that from about 1880 to 1910. Uh, that's at the Goddard Institute of Space Studies. Their estimates are that we have warmed about 1.08 degrees C relative to that baseline. So we're well over half the way with a lot of thermal inertia, meaning that since the oceans, we still have a with the given level of uh, greenhouse gases, even if the concentrations just stayed where they are, we're out of energy balance in the Earth, meaning that the oceans have not yet warmed in equilibrium with the uh, net energy balance. So we still have another 0.3 or even 0.4 degrees C just built in in terms of momentum. And the goal is to stay below 2 degrees C. And the carbon budget that would enable us to do that with any level of confidence, say even a 50% chance, much less a two-thirds or 90% chance, is without doubt well under half a century and probably best guess about 25 years. There was a recent article published last week that said maybe we have a, another decade more than we thought. My colleagues immediately dismissed the article by saying that it was calibrated wrong by saying that we're only at 0.9 rather than 1.07 degrees above baseline. So they said that's the only reason the article came up with the slightly longer answer was that it used a wrong calibration as where we start right now. So one believes one's colleagues uh, and uh, it doesn't give us comfort that we have a very, very short period of time to do that. Second thing we have to do is adaptation. And adaptation reflects the fact that if we're lucky to stop between one and a half and two degrees C, that's a big change from uh, the past and a huge amount of built-in uh, propensity for damage more heat waves, more droughts, more floods, and a lot more than we've seen right now at 1.08 degrees C. So we're building in a tremendous danger, and perhaps the biggest danger, if you really don't have enough to worry about, um, you should have Jim Hansen for a colleague, because he just drove me crazy all the time, telling me it's much worse than I imagined. Uh, and uh, Jim Hansen, of course, was uh, America's lead climate scientist and NASA's lead climate scientist for 30 years. Absolutely brilliant. And what worries uh, Hansen is the fact that the last time Earth was just a little bit warmer than now, <coughs> maybe 0.2 or 0.3 degrees C warmer than now, in other words, what we would count as 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial. The last time that happened on a sustained basis was the previous interglacial period, which the geologists call the Eemian period. 
That was 130,000 to 115,000 years ago. And what Hansen is emphasizing is that during the Eemian, we know with certainty that the sea level was about eight meters higher than now. And we know that that means that the two great ice sheets of Antarctica and Greenland were substantially degraded or disappeared during much of that period. And that is what Hansen is saying, that even the two degree standard is recklessly dangerous. We're already in a zone, arguably, where once the slow feedbacks of the warming oceans catch up and other kinds of feedback such as potentially uh, based on an article just published this week that showed that the carbon fluxes from the rainforest have turned to uh, outward fluxes. Uh, we, there are many runaway positive feedback processes that could start and maybe we don't even need more warming than we have already built into the system to degrade profoundly parts of uh, the Antarctic and Greenland ice sheets. Well, we built most of our great cities in the world uh, at the sea level, and Adam Smith explained why that was a really smart thing to do in 1776 in the Wealth of Nations. You get a lot of trade and specialization and division of labor by uh, being at uh, the low cost uh, trade at the coastlines, but if the coastline shifts uh, and the sea level rises by several meters, this is utter disaster. At a minimum, we're going to have to adapt to what's built in, and adaptation is tens of billions of dollars, city by city, to protect against rising sea levels. And that's why nobody does it, except the Dutch because they've been doing it for a thousand years. They're really smart. Uh, they're looking ahead all the time. They're under uh, sea level, uh, and uh, they know that it's no joke for them. Whereas in Houston, we had an idiot governor mental protection agency on behalf of the oil industry, and that's how he became governor. That's America. Uh, he's an idiot. Uh, my first advice to him after the flood was leave, go home, shut up, go. Because we have these jerks that are so irresponsible and corrupt. And then the first thing that happened was Houston got flooded and they asked for a $175 billion bailout. And I said what I'm going to tell you in a couple of minutes. Go ask Exxon, they're in your neighborhood. Why are you asking me? You denied it, you sued the EPA, you endangered my life repeatedly. You have the oil industry right there, they pay your bills, let them do it. But the basic point is Houston was a sitting duck for the kind of flooding that came. Indeed, as soon as you Google Houston and floods, you find innumerable articles that say it's not a matter of if, it's only a matter of when this kind of massive disaster will hit and nothing was done. So that's the uh, truth of uh, our difficulties here. But the third part is what are we going to do about fairness? What are we going to do about places that are hit, places that are devastated? Who is responsible and how can we hold responsible parties uh, to account. In my view, it's all interconnected, of course, because if we can hold responsible parties to account, we can speed the mitigation and the adaptation. What actually is going on on this issue of climate change? There are two big problems that are the biggest uh, problems. One is we have a massive technical problem, which is converting from the energy system that we know over the past 100 years and that has grown up over the past 200 years, converting that in 30 years as we have to do to stay below 
well below 2 degrees C and maybe even not well below enough, according to Hansen, in order to do that is a massive set of technical challenges. How do you run a system on renewable energy? What do we do about nuclear power? How do we change from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles in short order? Is it feasible? Yes. Is it easy? No. <coughs> we really have to engineer it and plan it in a directed way that we do for almost nothing in this world. Think of how long the debate over the Heathrow extended extra runway has gone on. If we debate changes of the energy system at anything like that pace, we'll be at 4 degrees C before we turn around. So how do we really make these changes? That's one problem. I call, that's the engineering problem. This world needs engineers right now, very seriously, to tell us what our options are and to show what plans are because the time horizon is a blink of an eye in terms of actual infrastructure. The second problem is politics. And the politics really comes down, in my experience, to the oil and gas industry. And that's good, in a way, because it's not politics of everything. It's not completely embedded in our psyches, our inability to move. It's not that we're trapped by human nature. We just face, in my country, but in a few other countries as well, the relentless assault of the oil industry. It used to also be the coal industry. They mercifully are going bankrupt. So we don't hear much about the coal industry anymore. They're almost gone. Great. Of course, I don't have to run for governor of West Virginia. But the truth is, there are almost no more miners anyway. So the idea that this is a big problem of mining employment, there are 20,000 miners, coal miners left in the United States in a labor force of 150 million people. That's the myth. There are still some people who own the coal industry, which cite the miners plight as their real plight, but it's fortunately not true. But the oil industry is a lot more powerful than the coal industry. They actually think they still run things. And they have run politics in the United States for a century. There's been no more powerful lobby than the, coal, than the oil and gas industry. And Exxon Mobil, which once upon a time was Standard Oil, uh, ruled the roost. And in US politics in the last 25 years, the Republican Party was basically bought out almost completely by the Koch brothers, David and Charles Koch. Turns out our politicians are pretty cheap to buy, so uh, it doesn't take a lot to buy them. Uh, you give them a little bit of money, and you tell them, if you do the wrong thing, I will run an opponent against you. And so it's a combination of the threat and the carrot. And if you put in a few billion dollars, you can own the Republican Party, which is basically what's happened. That's why the country is, that's half the reason why the country is so crazy. The other half is the president. That's a <laughs> phenomenon uh, in and of itself uh, that has no scientific explanation <laughs> it is the flutter of the butterfly wing that uh, brought us Mr. Trump. Um, so we have a major political problem, which is how to confront the power of the oil and gas industry. I think it relates heavily to climate justice. So first of all, I'm going to talk about losses and damages. That is compensation for being hit by climate change. We don't have any global programs for that right now. The hurricane hits, and the poor countries pray. The drought hits, the World Bank sends a staff member. And that's it. We sometimes have emergency food relief, 
We have refugee movements. We have refugee camps. But basically, we do not have a regime that says, you've been hit. Here's the financing that you need for recovery. Here's your insurance payment for this predictable shock. Here's the compensation for what you are due. We have no regime like that at all. We have a category, though, in the Paris Climate Agreement called losses and damages. And losses and damages says that these, the shocks that are incurred as the result of climate change should be attended to by the global community. And Article 8.1 of the Paris Climate Agreement says, parties recognize the importance of averting, minimizing, and addressing loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change, including extreme weather events and slow onset events. But then in the second part of the agreed document that's called Decisions to Give Effect to the Treaty, it's interesting that paragraph 52 says that the parties agree that Article 8 of the agreement, that's this one, does not involve or provide any basis for any liability or compensation. In other words, don't come for us. We don't owe you anything. That's rich country speak for we'll sign, but don't dream. And I want to propose that we go after the rich countries and go after the rich governments, notwithstanding this clause. And we do it in a lot of different ways that I'm going to discuss. So I think that one of the most promising ways to rethink climate justice is from a legal perspective. Not a negotiating perspective, not a development aid perspective, but from a legal liability perspective. And to flood the courts with the lawsuits and with the tests of responsibility because the responsibility is uh, both existing, I believe, and can be made to be real because it will become more and more clear as the years go ahead of who is really responsible. Even the learning from these four hurricanes this summer has been quite dramatic. Even the American people can't stare at that and say that's nothing. Uh, that's dramatic and it's raised four weeks of Climatology 101 in the newspapers. So we've had nonstop education about rising sea levels, about bigger rainfall patterns, about uh, who is responsible for the, the climate change. So the legal doctrine that most closely applies is what's called public nuisance in uh, UK and US law. And it's both a tort and a criminal part of the criminal code. But a public nuisance is a, 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 an invasion of someone's right to their property and to their environment by the deliberate actions of someone else. What makes it, that's a nuisance. What makes it a public nuisance is when a whole community, the whole general public, is affected by this denial of the use or the safety of one's land and environment. So it's an act or a mission that obstructs, damages, or inconveniences the rights of a community. It can be treated in some cases as a criminal wrong, and it can be treated in other cases as a tort. In other words, where you have civil liability as a result of this. In general, nuisance law under normal uh, common law has two conditions to be able to collect on a nuisance created by others. And this is practical challenge. One is that there is some duty between uh, the alleged uh, uh, perpetrator of the harm and the, uh, the victims of that harm, those who have suffered, and that there is, uh, that causation can be established. So there's some measure of duty and some measure of, and a measure of causation. For uh, climate change, duty comes down to concepts like foreseeability of harms. If we were in the pre-climate science era and damage was being done by greenhouse gases that were not understood, then 
under normal tort doctrine, there would be no possibility to claim damage because there would be no duty of somebody that was either selling uh, carbon energy sources or causing the pollution because they wouldn't know about it. So one basic standard is that there was intention, meaning that there was foreknowledge, there was foreseeability of what could occur, or there was reckless disregard that the evidence was there, but there was absolute negligence in not paying attention to the damages that could result. There's another doctrine which I think is very important, which is also increasingly being tested in the law, and that's the doctrine of public trust, which is a doctrine that government has a fundamental responsibility to its citizens to take actions to defend their safety. So a basic legal vision that is shaping up is to combine public nuisance and public trust law. The nuisance involves the production, the willful production and sale of a hazardous substance, carbon-based energy, even when it's known how dangerous it will be, especially if one can establish not only foreseeability but a disregard or a recklessness in the, uh, the sale of that product. And the public trust doctrine is that a government like the U.S. government or the U.K. government has a responsibility to its citizens to regulate those or take action against those who uh, are perpetrating the nuisance. So we now have, uh, I'll give a, a clear example uh, that is part nuisance law and partly uh, was uh, under legislative, uh, uh, under uh, um, legislation, uh, legislative uh, act as well. But BP paid $20 billion in damages for the oil spill of 2010. So that was a case where there was a clear perpetrator, there was a clear damage, the damage was a massive public nuisance which deprived people of livelihoods, of their beachfronts, uh, of uh, their property value, and so forth. The U.S. government in this case acted to defend the public trust or acted on, on behalf of the public, took BP to court, and BP settled for $20 billion. Pretty uh, direct application of this. The question is whether this kind of approach can work in the climate sphere. So what does one need to make that work? One needs perpetrators intent, causation. And those are all challenging in climate uh, action. They're challenging from a number of points of view. Uh, from the point of view of causation, they're challenging from the basic question that we call attribution, which is, was Hurricane Maria or Hurricane Harvey or a drought uh, in the Sahel a caused by anthropogenic factors, by global warming? And the answer, of course, as you know, is we almost never know whether that's the case because all of those kinds of disturbances, shocks, were observed without anthropogenic change. Weather is unstable. Weather has variation. Any particular event uh, almost always cannot be attributed by basic principles of physics or thermodynamics to uh, an anthropogenic forcing. But what the courts have long done to make that not really even a tough obstacle, and certainly not an insuperable obstacle, is to accept a measure of probability of cause. So uh, attributable risk in epidemiological terms. And this is done, for example, in all of the successful lawsuits on dangerous chemicals leading to cancer, on suing the tobacco industry, on uh, asbestos cases, and many others like it, where the courts do not 
insist that a case of lung cancer was due to the product of the defendant, but rather that the defendant's product raised the probability of that incident sufficiently that there is a some kind of legal preponderance of causation that the court will recognize. The courts are not super sophisticated in probability uh, law, and so they've used a pretty basic standard, uh, which is, uh, is there 50 percent or more chance that this was anthropogenic? And that is a kind of attributable risk or relative risk uh, factor that uh, you have doubled the probability of such and such occurrence in some meaningful sense. And so that more than half the cases of that occurrence are due in a meaningful way to that underlying cause. That's not a tough standard for many kinds of climate shocks already. All of the consequences of extreme heat waves, for example, are easily passing the tests of preponderance in the sense of uh, an increased uh, likelihood or a 50 percent probability. So the way that uh, climate attribution has evolved over the last 10 years is basically to accept that every attribution is a statement about probabilities. And if you have a true model of the climate system, then you ask the question, what is the probability of a threshold event or an extreme event occurring with anthropogenic forcings and without anthropogenic forcings, and therefore what is the change of probability that has come from the fact that we have loaded the atmosphere to 405 parts per million of CO2 rather than the pre-industrial 280 parts per million. There's a lot of complexity about this, but attribution science has leaped forward in the last 10 years, so the issue of causation on the same standards of tobacco or asbestos or chemical products or many other nuisance law factors is uh, actually, I think, very much within reach, though it's true to say that rare events like Category 5 hurricanes, though they can be elucidated by thermodynamic principles, such as Kerry Emanuel at MIT, the actual statistical record to do it is tough, and the climate models are even tougher because the scale resolution for these storms and modeling these storms is beyond uh, computational power in many cases. So we still have attribution problems for precisely the kind of shock that I started with. But a recent project of Climate Central, for example, which you can find at the wonderful website of uh, world weather attribution, estimated the probability of the extreme heat waves of 2017. And the conclusion, oh, I thought I, yes, uh, there it is, uh, that uh, made the record-breaking 2017 summer temperatures in the Euro-Mediterranean region at least 10 times more likely. So damages from that kind of extreme heat wave would easily pass a court uh, judgment or a uh, probabilistic uh, liability assessment if the other conditions apply. What about the ability to target particular malfactors in a case where climate change is the result of millions of actions on a cumulative basis over decades, if not centuries? This raises philosophical questions that are quite important. Who's responsible for the CO2 from Exxon's oil? Is it the person who's driving the car, or is it ExxonMobil itself? And that's a very practical question. Even if one were to pass the threshold that it's ExxonMobil, does that matter in a world in which Exxon is one of hundreds of uh, enterprises that produce petroleum uh, and one of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of enterprises that emit greenhouse gases? I think the answer is not hopeless, actually, because it turns out that the largest emitting enterprises, some of them well beyond our court uh, claims, are not small parts of the cumulative historic CO2 emissions 
And this is a well-known article uh, by Richard uh, Heed. I don't actually know how to pronounce uh, his name uh, for sure, but that was published in 2014 where he did very careful work in uh, collecting the responsibility of enterprises and their successors because Exxon is the result of uh, lots of uh, transformations since the Standard Oil days. But uh, carrying through the long historic record, he found that Chevron and Exxon, which are both uh, uh, descendants of uh, Standard Oil indeed, are responsible for together almost 7% of all global emissions from the middle of the 18th century to uh, the year 2010. That's astounding. That's wonderful for lawsuits. So I'm very excited about ExxonMobil being dragged through the courts because this is not a small player. It's one that actually has the chance to be held accountable. Now, uh, if one looks at a national level as well, the United States in historic uh, terms, uh, this is from 1850 to 2013 data, but that's pretty good for even the adding an extra century beforehand because that was a little bit of deforestation and a very little bit of coal use. The United States uh, is historically responsible for about 27% of historic uh, greenhouse, not, not greenhouse, CO2 emissions. That's a lot of historic responsibility. Next comes China at about 11%. China's rising in responsibility. But this means also that the US government is vulnerable to a charge of the public trust. And the defense of the US that there are 192 other countries in the UN, why are you coming to me? I have little to do with this is also not a meritorious defense and there's some good evidence for that. Now, what about responsibility? The good thing that makes the companies responsible is that they're liars and cheaters. And so they have a long record of knowing and faking it. And so as the record gets more and more exposed, their legal vulnerability rises considerably. And this is very exciting. Uh, because they really are cheaters and they have uh, suborned the political system for decades and the evidence that is now being disgorged by subpoena power and lawsuits shows that they have known about the climate risks for decades and that they concocted strategies that were designed to delay any action and that that has continued almost up to the present. So these are not good behaviors who said, what could I do? Uh, they all wanted to drive the cars. I warned them, but you know, it, it wasn't me. It was the opposite. It has been a record of abusing and trying to stop any alternatives for decades and doing it deceitfully. So this is a typical ad from ExxonMobil. They don't do it anymore because now the lawyers tell them don't, don't do it. But that 3.5% of historic emissions is still there based on this. So they wrote in March 2000, even less is known about the potential positive and negative impacts of climate change. In fact, many academic studies and field experiments have demonstrated that increased levels of carbon dioxide can promote crop and forest growth. Isn't that wonderful? Um, so that's what their long historical record is. There's a very nice article by Naomi Oreskes and uh, Jeffrey Supran that came out uh, uh, this summer uh, in Environmental Research Letters looking at the uh, back uh, documents, uh, the background documents that were released uh, in subpoenas and, and uh, various lawsuits and demonstrating the contradictions between the public statements and the statements inside the company. So this is very good news, I think, from the point of view of legal culpability. This is something different. I would say from today, if this is meaningful, because this was in the paper today, uh, 
uh, GM announces that it's going all electric. Okay, once you start there, they weren't there for a long time, but once you start there, that kind of action, if it's real, puts a break on legal culpability in the same sense. And so I think that these are the kinds of uh, nuances uh, that are needed. Well, the lawsuits have started, uh, and uh, just last week, the uh, attorney representing San Francisco has sued some of my favorite uh, Chevron, uh, ConocoPhillips, ExxonMobil, Royal Dutch Shell, uh, has sued them for the costs of the incremental infrastructure that San Francisco needs to build for safety from flooding. And they're suing exactly on the basis of a public nuisance doctrine. This is another lawsuit called Juliana versus the United States of America, also known as the Children's Trust case, which was filed last year in Oregon, which said that the United States government has failed to uh, represent, to act in the, uh, as public trustee of the environment by failing to have an environmental program. Obama should have settled this case, agreeing thereby putting U.S. environmental policy under the jurisdiction of the federal courts, but his Justice Department fought it, which was bad, really a mistake. Till the last days, I was also calling the White House, what are you doing? Settle. You've got this idiot coming. Uh, why are you defending your actions. They didn't. But the lawsuit continues and the judge has refused to throw it out, which is good news because there have been several motions to dismiss the lawsuit, but the judge said there's really a case here. These young defendants, these ch uh, young, uh, young people who are the plaintiffs, can really demonstrate harm and they can demonstrate, uh, or they potentially can demonstrate that public trust uh, is uh, not being honored. So let me uh, summarize what I think are concepts that we need to reach a full and proper uh, position on uh, climate justice. What would climate injustice entail? I think at least three standards that we want to round out this picture. One is efficiency, so we want to make sure that the kinds of settlements and uh, arrangements that are uh, resulting are not massively raising costs of, uh, of uh, uh, mitigation, but are actually uh, keeping costs low. And here we have coasts on our side, because if the legal responsibility direction can take hold, and if one can make a direct link between the fossil fuel owners and the ultimate damages, that is almost the Coase theorem of establishing property rights with the, the public for a safe climate and then forcing uh, either liability or negotiation to lower the overall costs of adjustment. So there's efficiency. Then there are the legal rights and remedies, which I'm arguing for, which is that when people are hurt by climate change, they need a day and a place and a doctrine in court. And that is that their right to a safe climate and the right to use their property and to enjoy their health in a safe way has been violated and that one can indicate who are responsible, both governments by failing to honor the public trust vis-a-vis -vis the companies operating within their territories, and second, the companies themselves, especially the bad behaviors. And then the third issue is the distributive justice. Partly losses and damages is a straight distributive justice issue because it's compensation, after all. And I think that that is perhaps the most powerful part of distributive justice. For a long time, Climate change has been discussed. The rich countries should help the poor countries to do X, Y, and Z. I'm not sure that's the best framing of climate justice. 
That's a framing of general distributive justice. But there's nothing special about climate uh, to make that the vehicle for redistribution in general. What I think is true about climate justice is that it should be compensation and remedy for harms as the main concept, but not to forget distributive justice more generally, of course. So it should operate within a just world, but the main focus should be on rights and remedies. I don't have time for that. <laughs> uh, but it basically says, what should we do? What we should do is hold the uh, emitters, and that is a delicate question of companies versus users of the products, but I'm using the companies as the placeholders for this, responsible in proportion to their share of the total, uh, total atmospheric loading. And that's a good standard because we have uniformly mixed greenhouse gases, so it is quite apparent that in standard liability law, how to allocate Chevron's responsibility versus Exxon's versus Saudi Aramco's versus others, it's the share of total emissions. And that's not a hard standard, and that's a very uh, typical way that a court would allocate liability in that. And the claim is that what the, uh, the plaintiffs in these cases should be demanding is at one level, compensation for damages and added costs of adaptation like the San Francisco lawsuit. So it's not only that you're hit, but that you are also have to take measures because of the harm that could befall you if you don't from what this public nuisance uh, is, uh, is causing. So it's the sum of the adaptation costs plus the compensation for losses and damages. But you have to put it through the probability lens first because no individual event could be claimed as a case of requiring full uh, compensation. At a minimum, you would allocate the compensation based on, or should, based on probability. That's not always how the courts do it. The courts sometimes say if it's more than 50%, you're fully responsible. But a better way to say it would be multiplying by the probability. There's an even better way to do it, and that is that all countries and communities should be insured against hydrometeorological phenomena. So this should be in the context of insurance. And basically what losses and damages would entail would be those responsible for the costs of higher insurance premia would pay the insurance premia on behalf of those who are suffering the net consequences. The basic rule is that since everybody is partly suffering and partly creating, it turns out you're a net recipient of these insurance premia if your share of world damages is greater than your share of contributions to the greenhouse gases, quite obviously. So it's a net effect. You owe for what you contribute, you receive for what the harms are, and probably best seen as introducing generalized climate insurance. And adaptation would then be exercised in the context of an insurance framework. What do I mean by that? To be efficient, you can't just pay every time there's damage. You pay every time there's damage if those who are receiving the insurance payments have exercised due care. What is due care in insurance? It is that you minimize the net costs of losses by undertaking all preventative actions that are cost effective. And so you undertake efficient adaptation, stop building in floodplains, and you will not be reimbursed for uh, buildings that are built in floodplains. You will only be reimbursed if you have responsibly built levees, maintained them, uh, built uh, uh, flood barriers, kept out of certain uh, high probability flood zones, and so forth. That's what insurance industry 
is good at, actually, not only the insuring, but also the protective safeguards in insurance policies, which are, in effect, adaptation requirements in order to be insured. We have nothing like that in the international system right now. There's rampant underinsurance. There's rampant underinvestment in adaptation. And there is no cross payments for anyone else's insurance uh, in this world except in a completely ad hoc way. So the argument is to make all of that systematic. I'm going to skip that. So finally, to say, just to summarize the components, we need a right to climate safety firmly and clearly stated. That is to say, you have a property right in a safe climate. Anyone who violates that property right, in principle, is vulnerable to uh, claim just claims of compensation. Second, we need government to be held accountable for the public trust. That the government needs to take actions also to help enforce judgments against companies. One way to do this, which is quite straightforward, is put on a carbon tax that's good for efficient adjustment, and then use the carbon tax as a fund to pay insurance premia for those who are net, uh, net vulnerable to shocks uh, by uh, the ongoing climate damage that's occurring or the increased climate risk that's occurring. Third, we need attribution science to give us the measures of what that probabilistic attribution should be. We need probabilistic settlements. We need joint and several liability for losses and damages, meaning that you can sue not everyone in the world, but sue those for the parts that they're responsible for. Even if we go to Exxon for just 3.5% of all the world's damages, that's great. Uh, and uh, that's uh, a lot of liability. And that is enough to actually, I believe, get them to rethink their game plan, which is already happening because of the challenges that are now underway. Hazard insurance as our key operational approach efficient adaptation measures under the insurance scheme, and then I don't have time to talk about uh, the intergenerational equity. Let me mention very quickly a couple of complementary approaches. Shareholder activism this year pushed through a shareholder resolution against management of Exxon for Exxon management to disclose each year the climate vulnerability to the company by changing standards of regulatory practice. How many assets will be stranded? What kind of lawsuits is Exxon vulnerable to? And of course, the management called on this shareholder resolution to be defeated, but it was voted by 62% of the shareholders. Really remarkable proxy uh, battle that uh, won in this case. A second is the lawsuit that's underway in New York State by the New York State Attorney General, I know I've got to stop, uh, which has sued Exxon for all those documents. And how is he suing Exxon? On the claim that Exxon has, has misled its investors. So securities fraud. Because under US securities law, you have to tell your investors about risk. Uh, and it has to be told straightforwardly. So this is a very exciting development as well. The final thing I want to mention is a, an initiative of Laurent Fabius, who is now president of the French Supreme Court and was the foreign minister who presided over COP21 and the Paris Climate Agreement. And he is now leading an effort for a new global pact for the environment to establish international law of the environment more clearly. President Macron announced at the General Assembly last week that he will try through French diplomacy to get this agreed in the UN General Assembly by the year 2020. What would this mean, in my view? It would make explicit and clear where the property rights lie. That's what Coase told us to do. 
I think that this is an invitation to uh, get this done right. Article 1 says, of the draft of this pact, says every person has the right to live in an ecologically sound environment adequate for their health, well-being, dignity, culture, and fulfillment. And Article 2 says that every state or international institution, person, natural or legal, has the duty to take care of the environment. So the idea, and then there's a whole draft treaty uh, behind this, but the idea is that we would clarify the international law, clarify the international responsibility, and go to court. Thanks. Thank you very much. Right, so we will have time for questions now. We're gonna take uh, maybe in a bundle of, of two or three, there's uh, roaming mics going around. If you could, uh, Jeff is going to pick who will ask questions. If you could briefly please state who you are and please, please keep your questions very short and make them questions. Right, please, uh, right there. Yep. You have to speak loud though. Got it. Thank okay. you. Maybe another one. Uh, right here, maybe, and then to to the other side. Of the road. Right, right here after. Yeah, the third. Yeah. And then we will. Yeah. Call. Okay. Great. Uh, right here, yeah. I can't hear you. Yeah. Okay, uh, very quickly. Uh, climate change is not the only issue in the world. It's not the only issue of justice and rights. Uh, and there is a body of international law on labor rights and under the Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, SDG 8 and SDG 16 have important labor standards built into them, including, by the way, ending modern slavery, which is a pervasive phenomenon in, in many countries, and ending child labor. So. This is not the only story here, uh, and it's not the uh, only part of uh, a just world, uh, but I think that categories are important, and I really like the Sustainable Development Goals for its holism. Uh, climate is SDG 13, and uh, labor uh, and decent work is SDG 8. Uh, on uh, the rule of law for low-income countries, the, the biggest problem actually is not uh, their courts, but uh, necessarily, but that even if they make a judgment against a powerful outside company, they have no way to enforce it. Ecuador tried to enforce a judgment against Chevron. It became incredibly complex, but Chevron countersued used uh, what's called the uh, investor state dispute settlement mechanism, took the case out of Ecuador into Ecuador, out of Ecuador, and basically used its phalanx of lawyers for a long time. I think that there is a cotter of uh, law specialists in these countries and internationally that are gonna build and work together though to find venues and to uh, argue for enforceability of judgments. Uh, on the question of who's going to fund uh, these lawsuits, uh, perhaps the oil companies. 
uh, because uh, a standard way to uh, fund uh, cases like this is on contingency basis. Uh, the lawyer works for, uh, with, without charging for anything, and when the settlement comes, the lawyer takes a fraction of the settlement if it's successful. If it's unsuccessful, they eat the costs. So I believe that we will have a period of public interest law accelerating. We're seeing it now. I find it a very important point. Eventually, these companies will fold their hands and w then we'll be on a more logical course and maybe we then make the compensation quite systematic that we have a price of carbon we're collecting. Remember, emissions of carbon are about 40 billion tons a year and a plausible uh, price of carbon might be 30 or 40 dollars a ton. But if you uh, just use three or four dollars a ton right now, that would be, say, uh, 150 billion a year if it were collected worldwide. That's not the only way to collect it, but that would fund quite a lot of losses and damages coverage. So the idea is not the lawsuits is the way to punch through, and eventually this turns into a more systematic, structured approach. Okay, we're going to take three more questions. Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe upstairs. Up there, right here? Yep. And second is number two. Yep. There. There, and then your third, so you don't jump over the balcony. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think that. We, oh, sorry. Take, Good. Uh, yep. Let's take a few questions. Um, what if the right to ecologically sound environment celebrates all the companies when they pay enough? I'm sorry, say it again. What, what if the, the right to an ecologically sound environment just breaks all the companies? I mean, Miles Allen and friends have just said, don't worry too much about it. It is increasing the thing. Uh, your, your colleagues in Colombia are saying, Daniel Rothman, with, uh, who's saying catastrophe is really on the way with some measurements of undersea sediment, that, that would easily break them. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm Santana Rafa. I'm, I'm a lawyer and specialized in the practice of international law. I have the status of very good expose by an economist or legal scholar, and I'm <laughs> which is refreshing. <laughs> and it was very clear about how to try to establish liability for national. My my question is about international courts. Um, I take it that you are interested and in, in very much so on the clarification of how the international law as a regime should regulate um, the regime of damages. However, you mentioned that it's very important the situation of investment law, so that is the investment tribunals, uh, for example, the arbitration that are organized by the World Bank. So if an, an idea world, why would you like to see Of interpretation of treaties by these tribunals. So, what would be your idea, your proposal, on the role of investment tribunals between yeah. investors and damages? Great. Uh, on, uh, say, Saudi Aramco, uh, companies like Saudi Aramco, op who asked the question? Yeah, operate uh, all over the world and have assets all over the world. Uh, and I'm not enough of a, uh, uh, certainly uh, of uh, an expert to know uh, what their particular vulnerability might be. In this San Francisco lawsuit, uh, a section of the, uh, of, of the uh, claim details how each of those defendants has a presence in San Francisco, so they try to establish uh, jurisdiction in a very specific way. I don't know whether that's required or not, uh, but it's and also uh, getting judgment and enforcing a judgment might be difficult. But there's nothing in principle, I think, that is different for uh, Saudi Aramco. And it's interesting. We don't know how meaningful it is yet, but Saudi Arabia, the Crown Prince, 
of course, has led an initiative in the last year to say we need to diversify away from oil. And my own version geopolitically of this story is that Saudi Arabia is the low cost producer of the remaining oil that needs to be uh, used in the world as we phase out to 2050. Not only Saudi Arabia, but basically the Middle East. I do think that there would be a valuable geopolitical deal to be made that said that companies like Statoil would stop exploring in the Arctic, for example, and Exxon and others would stop their explorations in the Arctic, that Canada would shut down its oil sands and all of the rest, and that we would accept the Middle East uh, as the low-cost residual producer, but expect that it's phasing out at 2050. And that, to my mind, is the big geopolitical deal to be made. We don't do geopolitics that way. Uh, we usually go bomb someone, unfortunately. Uh, but I think that that actually is the, the right, way to, uh, right way to do this. Uh, would this break the companies? Uh, I don't know. Uh, if everything were fully accounted, it could. It is breaking uh, the coal industry. Uh, that's a merciful deliverance. Uh, so I don't see that as really a problem. Uh, if it really broke the companies in a proper way, that's also not a tragedy. We have bankruptcy law, and the companies would continue to operate. Uh, they're Isn't the, that the problem? No. No, no, no. What it, what, what it means is that the shareholders would lose their wealth and that they would still operate as they... We need them, by the way, to phase out systematically over the next 30 years. That, that's my point. It's not that tomorrow uh, Exxon should close shop. We don't want that, actually. We have a billion internal combustion engine cars on the road, and we need very quickly to turn them into electric vehicles, but not to scrap them. So I think that a phase out that is systematic and, and uh, efficient is what we're looking for in the world. On the question of the global uh, environment, uh, investment environment, um, I, uh, and especially the, my, my daughter heads a center at Columbia Law School on uh, international investment law and foreign investment in general. She and her colleagues are pretty much uh, dead set against investor state dispute settlement mechanisms as they currently pervade almost all the bilateral investment treaties. And I've learned from her and her colleagues how unbelievably abusive this system is right now because these arbitration awards don't even follow the most basic standards of law. They're secret. They're not bound by starry uh, diseases. Their precedent means almost nothing. The, uh, the uh, judgments are quite arbitrary, and uh, poor countries have been held hostage by these uh, uh, investor state uh, operations. So we have recommended, uh, it's really at this institute's behest, closing that down. Uh, it was one of the reasons why we at uh, Columbia Earth Institute, uh, when we wrote about this, opposed uh, the, uh, opposed the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership and uh, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, transatlantic negotiations because they both contained an ISDS chapter that was pretty much unchanged and, and uh, um, uh, and that, uh, that, that continued uh, the abuses of that system. So I would like us to move to stronger, clear international law, very importantly, and I would like to see ISDS, this investor state dispute settlement mechanism, basically turned into, phased out, and turned into a strengthening of national courts. Okay, we'll take three more questions, and unfortunately we have to wrap it up. Jeff, choose yeah. three. Aha. Please, number one, one here, in the number front one row. here, and number two here. The lady yeah. there. Okay, yeah, yeah. And, well, and then uh, maybe maybe yeah. one more up upstairs. And, okay, please, sir. Yeah. Okay, so we have one, two, three. Go Great. ahead. 
Thank you. Yeah. Yes, please. Yeah, farmers. Farmers, uh -huh. yeah. Um, my name is John Schwab, I'm an alumnus. Uh, and I, I've been giving you outlined a very good time frame to deal with this. Yes. Unprecedented rapidity in which this revolution has to occur. How can, how can a legal process possibly address Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. OK. Um, I think the idea of allocating space in the atmosphere is not the right approach. And uh, in a way, I'm talking against what was the climate justice idea for a long time, which was uh, contract and converge or equal per capita rights to pollute and so forth. I don't find that uh, at all uh, commensurate with damages being recognized by those who have committed the offense. And so the historical responsibility comes in here as having to provide the payment. So it's not different from that. There is nothing to allocate, by the way. Everybody has to move as quickly as possible to zero. And if we do that as quickly as possible, by 2050, we'll be in a new energy regime. It can't happen overnight, so it's got to be phased out. So the basic thing is that governments need everywhere to understand what are the energy options and how to stop investing in coal and how to start investing in wind, solar, and uh, other technologies. In this area, the poor countries are, have a certain important advantage. The poorest places in the world are on the desert margins the Sahel of Africa. This is the best sunshine in the whole world. They could become energy powerhouses. They could become major exporters of solar energy. And so there's actually a big business model here that has been made possible by the decline of photovoltaic prices as well as the imperative to move to uh, out of uh, fossil fuels, which they don't own, into renewables, which they have uh, galore. In terms of farmers, uh, it's a very good question because farming is incredibly vulnerable to these shocks. Right now, when crops fail, there's almost no crop insurance. There's, and for smallholder impoverished farmers, there's almost no relief, just desperation. And Africa is incredibly vulnerable because it's 70% of the population lives in semi-arid to arid uh, environment. This is not a wet continent except uh, in the Congo Basin and the very southern tip of, uh, uh, of the Gulf of Guinea. And uh, otherwise, Africa is quite dry and likely to be destabilized. So what this means is crop insurance. It means a way for smallholders to be compensated for droughts, for heat waves, for thermal stress, which we don't have right now. Uh, so I think that there's something important that can be done. On the timing of this issue, I am not recommending this as the main strategy for mitigation or adaptation. I'm recommending it as the forward edge for losses and damages. The only way we can accomplish this job is to say by 2050, we have to be out of the fossil fuel business. And that respects the, the carbon budget. That's what we need to do to have a 70 plus percent chance to stay well below two degrees C. So, that's the issue. To get there, every country, especially the large uh, countries which account for the vast majority of emissions in the world, need a 30-year ahead strategy. This cannot be politics year to year. This cannot be putting Rick Perry, of all people, uh, responsible for US energy policy. Uh, 
you know, we're in the, I think we're in the last throes of this fantasy world of our oil industry. We've got Texas everywhere. Uh, now begging for a $200 billion bailout also because they're so rugged individualists. Uh, but they have cheated the world on this for a very long time. But now they own the State Department right now. Uh, they own the Department of Energy. They own the EPA with this Hack Pruitt whose whole career has been like uh, Abbott in Texas suing the EPA so this is the worst miscreants that you could imagine. But it basically is the oil lobby having its fling. But I think it's the last time. So what does it mean? It means that countries need plans. And that I can't emphasize enough. You cannot do this without a 30-year plan. It doesn't mean you know everything that's going to happen. But I can tell you pretty surely from all of the probabilistic assessments, we're very likely to be driving electric vehicles and we're very likely to be operating on a power grid that is largely powered by wind, solar, geothermal, and nuclear. And that combination is going to carry most of our needs and we're almost surely going to move to almost, or I won't say almost surely, but very likely move to uh, all electric cities for uh, meeting uh, heating, cooling needs, transport, and so forth. So we can see the changes that are needed. If you calculate the costs, it's roughly an incremental 1% of world output per year would be my estimate. That's about a trillion dollars a year incremental above our normal energy costs. What's 1% among friends to save the, the planet? I don't find it a very big deal. Uh, and that's basically what we need to mobilize. And then the costs will come down and we'll really enjoy uh, our new technologies, which will be a lot healthier, a lot safer, a lot smarter, a lot cleaner, and uh, lead the planet uh, decarbonized. Okay, unfortunately, we have to uh, finish here. Uh, the good news is that the conversation will continue just next week, uh, Wednesday, 11th of October at 1 p.m. Our Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment will host Canadian Minister of Environment and Climate Change, the Honorable Catherine McKenna, MP, so you can ask her more questions. She's wonderful, but ask her why don't they close down the oil sands. Exactly. And... And please ask her, rather than agonizing about our idiot president and his Keystone Pipeline, why Canada doesn't just simply say no. All she has to do is say no. They've got a fantastic prime minister. They have a fantastic minister of environment whom you're going to meet next week. They just need to say no. Thank you very much.